I am Katherine Reynolds Lewis. I'm the founder of the Institute for Independent Journalists and myself. I just celebrated my 14 year anniversary as a full time independent journalist. And I would say the last 10 years I've been really focused on creating long form, which is why I'm so excited to hear from the experts and people whose work I admire so much. I'm going to launch a poll. Uh, launch. and cough because uh, we're all uh, struggling a little bit. So please take the poll and we'll uh, share the results in a little bit. So the Institute for Independent Journalists is was created by a group of us who really wanted a space that was by and for freelancers of color, where we could really share community wisdom, where we could innovate and find best practices that help everyone uh, to be sustainable, both financially and emotionally and ultimately advocate for the importance of independent journalists as a core part of the media ecosystem and really uh, the stories that are told by a diverse set of freelance journalists are crucial to our democracy to a functioning media ecosystem and um, that's why we're so passionate about it so i'm going to start by briefly introducing um, our panelists and then we're going to go into to questions so I'm really excited to have with us here, um, in no particular order, Erica Hayasaki, a writer based in Southern California and professor at the University of California, Irvine, and author of Somewhere Sisters, really remarkable work of nonfiction that reads like a novel about three sisters, um, two of whom are identical twins separated through adoption um, and transatlantic, you know, across continents and across the ocean, and um, and the other two who were created as sisters by adoption. So really powerful. Um, I, I get got chills reading it. So I highly recommend Order Somewhere Sisters. Erica um, has made a really compelling true story um, that is really complicated and addresses a lot of the issues all of us care about, right? Race, family, identity, belonging, you know, what it means to be a family. So um, Erica will be the first to take a question. I'm just going to make sure I touch on everyone. Um, I got a little too excited about the book. <laughs> Sorry about that. Jaya Lee is a contributing writer at the New York Times Magazine. Um, Lottie Joyner is an award-winning journalist with more than two decades of experience um, cover as a reporter. And uh, the new assistant managing editor of Verite News, a non New Orleans nonprofit newsroom that is brand new. So really excited to have Lottie here. And Valeria Fernandez is a Phoenix-based investigative journalist and managing editor of Palabra, which was created by NAHJ to support freelancers and publishes some really powerful, um, exciting long form work. So we'll start with Erica. Um, if you could just share, how long have you been creating long-form journalism and what have has really made it work for you? So I, I, I used to be on staff at the LA Times and that's where I started to learn more about long-form journalism and I was occasionally allowed to do longer pieces. And then I left, um, uh, I guess it was about 12 years ago, um, something like that. And I started teaching and I thought I would, you know, freelance for magazines and do long form. And I, I thought I could just sort of transition smoothly. And it was actually quite hard, um, way harder than I ever realized. I was really ignored for years trying to get stories into publications. Um, I knew I wanted to focus on long form, but it was, it really took a lot of, um, there were not a lot of resources like this available for me at that time. And I just didn't have the right connections or, you know, a lot of my pitches just went completely ignored for years. <laughs> so, um, and I can talk about how that shifted and how that changed, but, um, but, you know, I balanced teaching and doing long form pieces and other projects. Um, and it's kind of a juggle, but, um, but it has been incredibly re rewarding over the last 10 years to do that and to connect particularly with um, other writers like yourselves who have been sort of this support network over the years. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Erica. Um, so Jaya, can you share sort of your journey as a long form journalist? Um, so I have been 
um, focusing on long form as if I went freelance about six years ago, a little more than six years. Um, and I was uh, just before I was a staff reporter at Mother Jones magazine covering um, police shootings and their aftermath. Um, and I had for a very long time wanted to um, try out long form um, and always fantasized about freelance life and what that might be like. Um, and so in 2016, I sort of finally took the leap and um, had less saved up than I should have probably. Um, and so the first year was really me flailing and trying to get my first um, long form piece out um, and was going into a lot of debt. Um, it was definitely a struggle financially. Um, and after about a year in my second year, I started picking up side hustles just through other freelancers I knew who would toss work my way. Um, a lot of it was, um, non-journalism and I had, I was lucky to have, um, some friends in particular, um, a friend of mine who, um, it actually, because of advice that Kaki here on the call gave me um, on a on a panel at the Asian American Journals Association conference um, to have an accountability buddy that you check in with every week. And I would say probably it's possible more than anything that's been the secret to my ability to remain a freelancer after all these years, both in terms of like getting um, ref referrals to assignments. Um, a lot of it was non-journalism related, which meant the work was a lot less fulfilling, but paid a lot more. Um, and also just like during those emotional down periods, um, helping to stay motivated, uh, read pitches, give feedback. It's all the kind of like uh, in between um, uh, you know, tools or, uh, you know, it really gave me the ability to kind of push through the, the toughest chapters of freelancing. Um, and of course, you know, I, I have been lucky and some of it, I would say was strategic. And a lot of it was just like being in the right place at the right time, um, picking up, uh, pretty significant fellowships that helped me a lot, uh, when I needed it. Um, so that, that's kind of the, the long and short of it and happy to go into more depth. Thank you, Jaya. Um, I think your accountability buddy may be in the audience. You can <laughs> click on this. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Katya, for uh, supporting the great work and supporting each other. And I that resonates so much with me. Um, I only wrote my book because my accountability buddy kept on me. <laughs> so, um, and I think groups like this, you know, f f also like one-on-one -on -one is super helpful, like to get really into the, like, I did not do the two hours of work on this pitch because I had a Girl Scout meeting or I had a daily assignment and, and trying to really troubleshoot why I didn't do that. But also bigger groups, I've been in three different, you know, um, groups of eight to 12 people that really, really support me just hearing about what other people are facing. So, Thank you. Um, and of course, yes, being being fortunate to have your I wouldn't say being in the right place, but having your excellent work recognized by the American Mosaic Prize probably helped with the debt. <laughs> yeah, that was single handedly the, the thing that got me out of debt. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's a prize that launched in 2018 that um, Valeria and I both won the same year. It was the very first year. It's a hundred thousand dollar prize, which is like unheard of in journalism. I mean, let alone um, as far as prizes go. Uh, it was huge. It was life changing, and it it we all every freelancer needs it. Um, to be honest, but it, it definitely is a um, has made a difference in my life for sure. Great. And um, before I go to Valeria and Lottie, I'm just going to share if I can figure out the poll. Um, share the poll. I'm going to end the poll and then share it. Okay, so it looks like mm -hmm. a good third of people are already creating long form 
and a lot of people would like to do more than they are now. So that's, that's interesting. I think that's how a lot of us feel that like, even when we're actually doing it, it's this small piece of our, of our daily and weekly routine. So Valeria, tell us a little bit about your sort of experience in the past as creating long form work, and then maybe it also touch on Palabra. Yeah, so I hope that there's some people in the audience maybe that had a similar experience in the sense that I come from writing in Spanish and that's been my passion since childhood. So I started working in a small community newspaper in 2003, back when you really printed the newspaper and I really wrote long. And that was like my first incursion on long form was writing really, really long stories uh, for the paper where that I spent a long time, you know, throughout the year. And I was constantly trying to build time to report on those big pieces. So when I transitioned uh, to be a freelancer, just out of the blue, right? Because I wanted to work on a long, long film. That's a, another uh, form of long, long uh, storytelling for six years. Um, I went into English, right? And I was very, very scared of like, okay, I am solid. I can write long. I can write kind of a narrative. I, I got this in me, you know, it flows through my veins, but can I do this in English? So in 2013, I think it was, I approached a local uh, paper here with a magazine called the uh, Phoenix, Phoenix New Times. And the editor there, Amy Silverman, I love her to pieces. She's a great editor, gave me the chance of my life to really write my first long form piece in, in English. And I fell in love with it. Uh, I, I really did. So a couple of things, I was already a freelancer for like three, four years, pretty established and solid with a lot of clients when I started doing the long form on my own in English. So that really helped me a lot because I had a number of uh, different sources of revenue. And in a similar way to Jaya, I leveraged assignments that were as a producer you know I have a lot of skills so I used everything I had to like be able to sustain my passion for long form frankly um, and so I did production work I did um, reporting for television I did radio I did commentary I built for everything I could and carved that space so I could do my my long form so it was it was a balance um, because um, it wasn't really that profitable at the beginning. And it really does take a long, long, long time. And as I said before to the panelists, uh, it's like a way of living. Working on long form stories is like, okay, this year or for the next two years, I choose to live with this story. And it means a lot of things. Um, I worked for, yeah, about two years on a story about a young man who committed suicide after he was deported uh, to Mexico for California Sunday Magazine. And that was a really hard story to live with for two years. And part of it, part of that time I was pregnant. So uh, it was a really interesting. So I think that that, oh, palabra, sorry. I know I was missing something. And now I am in the position of, you know, it's kind of payback because uh, reporters pitch me stories that are really, really long. And we embrace a lot of that work if it fits, you know, if it's the right story if it, in, in Palabra. So hopefully I'll put my email in here. I'll be hearing from some of you who want to, you know, I'm an editor, so we're looking for stories. And so uh, I invite you to check out Palabra and see some of the long form we've done and to pitch some of it for us. Great. Thank you, Valeria. And last but definitely not least, Lottie, can you mm -hmm. share a little bit about your experience with long form and how you you have made it work or you've seen colleagues make it work? Sure. So uh, I actually started out in magazine journalism. I didn't start out at a newspaper. So I started out my journalism career writing long pieces, writing features and enterprise stories. <clears throat> so that was my beginning. And then as journalism changed, <laughs> You know, people wanted quick, quick hits, but I also found that there was a need. Uh, my um, my beat or my focus has always been on the civil rights movement, on social justice issues, inequality, like health disparities, disparities, mass incarceration, the criminal justice system, and I found that there was a need for 
for uh, publications who did not have someone on staff to write about a civil rights movement uh, uh, anniversary, like maybe when Fannie Lou Hamer stood before the 1964 Democratic National Con Convention and said this huge speech, or when the Emmett Till case was reopened, or the anniversary of the deaths of James Cheney and uh, Sharna Goodman and Cheney in Mississippi, that I had that knowledge in that, um, and because I had written about the civil rights movement for more than 20 years, I found a way to leverage that knowledge of writing about that. And I would pitch those stories to places who did, as I mentioned, who didn't have someone on staff to say, hey, write about that. Uh, I'm, I am now at, oh, I was editor of the Crisis Magazine for four years. The Crisis is, the official publication of the NAACP. So we focus on social and political issues, Black history, African-American art and culture. And <clears throat> I edited long form pieces uh, around those issues. Now I'm at Verite, uh, which is a New Orleans based nonprofit news outlet. It's brand new. So we're building the newsroom as I speak, but the focus is on long form narratives. Um, long form narratives around issues uh, that impact those in diverse communities. We really want to uplift those in communities that the mainstream press usually ignore. So we go to neighborhoods and um, diverse communities and we talk to people about what's that top, what's top of mind for you? What issues concern you the most, right? Health, the fact that there's no quality health care in your neighborhood, crime. Um, uh, inequality in terms of the wealth gap, in terms of the minimum wage. What about inflation? You know, you say you have to drive two hours to uh, to a great job, right? And so now gas prices are really, and so we capture those narratives uh, of those whose voices aren't usually heard. And that's what I really like about this piece. And that's what I've done for the past 20 years. Thank you, Lottie. And I hope when you start taking freelance, you will let us know <laughs> and we'll put, a, we'll put a call for pitches out on the IIJ uh, newsletter or listserv. Um, so I would love to get maybe a little bit into the nitty gritty. There's actually already a question that I think is really interesting is sort of how do you organize the sort of pre-reporting, pitching, reporting, writing, is there anything that you've learned over the years that changes that you sort of wish you knew earlier that changes how you approach the sort of um, organizational process of, you know, getting into knowing it, maybe even start with knowing it's a long form story and then going into it and, and executing it. Well, when I did a project, uh, a project, it was a year long project for USA Today and it was about recidivism. And I started off with a statistic. And my whole project was around answering that statistic. So the statistic was 50% of people who are released from prison return within five years. And I'm like, what? Oh my God, you know? And so my whole project was centered around talking to those um, who were who were back in prison, talking to those who had gone to prison several times. But I just, I started off with that little nugget and I built from there. And that was my process. And that's a lot of my process of asking, why is this, right? I started off asking, I see a huge uh, d disparity. And, I'm, and I start off with the big question, why is this? And then I start researching around that question. I go to, the, of course, the Department of Justice statistics, and I go to other statistics and I'm um, trying to gather information around uh, organizations that work uh, on criminal justice issues and mass incarceration. And so I start off with the with the big picture. And then I get to the nitty gritty of those who are working on the problem. And then I think about who should I talk to in terms of personal stories that can get across this problem. So we actually went into jails, right? We went into, we went to, uh, we traveled to Oklahoma, we traveled to Louisiana uh, and talked to people in jails about when they, you know, why were they back there? Uh, when they left, 
what systems were created by the criminal justice system that basically put them back in prison. And so that's my process of starting off with the why and then going from there. Great. Thank you so much, Lottie. And um, actually, we had a question in the chat that I'm just going to give my own opinion for, and then maybe the other folks can include their their take on it, is what does it even mean to say long form? So to me, I think of long form not so much as the length of the story, but that it's going deeply into a narrative following an individual or an institution over some time. So I think it's more the um, medium than the actual length. I've written the stories that are 4,000, 4,500 words that I consider long form. So I would say, you know, it's not about the number of words, it's more um, the experience of reading or watching. But um, one of the other three, if you wanna jump in and talk about your process and then maybe also answer that question. I can talk about something that I learned that maybe you maybe you won't do. <laughs> um, when I when I was trying desperately to get somebody to trust me to do a long form piece, when I transitioned into, you know, away from newspapers, um, and I said, like, nobody was taking my pitches. I did have one editor from this thing called Kindle Singles, which was in existence a long time ago, which would sometimes allow writers to do long form. And um, I wrote this Kindle Single at the time. It was about... Um, it was an it was like an investigative narrative on uh, looking at it had people in it who had um, young men who had like essentially drowned in a corn bin a uh, grain bin in the Midwest um, and it you know examined um, our dependence on grain and corn in this country and through these narratives of these survivors and people who passed away but um, so that's a story that I wanted to do but how did I do that how did I get there nobody's paying for me to do this. You know, if you're at the LA Times, maybe they'll put you on a plane to do something. But this was a long form project involved like court, going to court records, getting court records, paying for those, traveling to the Midwest. I lived in California. I had a baby at the time. Um, I brought my baby to do the report. I brought my daughter who was a baby to uh, Illinois at the time to do reporting and I funded it myself. You know, I did not know how else to do this. And I just was like, well, I believe this is a, an important story. Um, nobody's, even though this editor was interested, they're not funding any of these expenses. A lot of times nowadays, I still have to fund things up front. I don't know if you all have to do that. And sometimes it takes months. It's taken over a year in some cases to get a lot of this money back. Um, and that is something that I think people are having more sophisticated conversations, freelancers, about working that into any contract ahead of time, that travel expense, um, childcare expenses, like that we know we're going to have to put up if we're going to travel to do a long form piece. Um, you know, it was just, I put a lot of risk up and I put a lot of it on myself again, because I did not have a network. I did not know what else to do. And I didn't, I couldn't get anybody to pay attention to me. <laughs> so I'm like, well, I'm going to do the story no matter what. But nowadays I think, you know, I have to plan out, okay, I have this fellowship. I have this grant that's going to cover some of this funding for travel, for records, for childcare. Um, you know, all of this has to be sorted, or I can have that worked out with an editor. And even I think in conversations with you, Kaki, maybe people have said, you know, you can have that paid out front, the travel, which, you know, you still have to fight for today, you know, even at big publications um, to get them to pay that before the thing is published, because the thing can get published in a year and you still have lost all that money for traveling. So I just think that's just logistically something that is important to think about too. Um, I can, I can add a bit to that. Um, also, Lottie, that that series you did for USA Today was really amazing. Um, I remember reading that um, when I was doing some research on parole life. Um, uh, man, it's I, I I really think there could be a whole conference just centered on like how do you sustain long form. It is truly difficult, and everything um, Erica and Lottie you guys have talked about so far resonates so deeply. Um, I can add just like. I guess a few lessons slash tools that I use on a regular basis. Um, one thing that was really instrumental for me, and I don't know if you would say the same, Erica, um, 
but the first piece I did, like looking back now on, on my first year as a freelancer, I spent a year and a half reporting my first long form um, story. I had written one feature while I was at Mother Jones um, and that did help in the reporting that I had done, the beat reporting I had done um, while on staff certainly helped me a lot. Um, and in terms of starting to build editor connections outside of um, outside of the newsroom I had been at. Um, but now I kind of look back on my first, on that first piece I did, um, it was for California Sunday. Um, also California Sunday, RIP. Um, we can talk more about the importance of publications that like really, you know, rely on freelancers and give them their first um, major byline um, for long form. Um, that I feel like that's probably gotten harder today than six years ago. Um, but now I look at that first piece as really an investment and it became really a calling card for me to then be able to, and it, you know, I always thought like after I wrote this piece, it was very difficult. It was about a mother who was grieving. Her son had been killed by the police. Um, and I followed her grief process for a year and a half and wrote about it. Um, when that was done, I thought that was an outlier. There's no way, there's no way I'm going to spend a year and a half um, reporting stories. It's just not, how, how would that be possible? And little did I know at the time that that was actually the norm. Um, I'm not saying every long form piece takes a year and a half to report, but the general timeline, at least for myself, and it, you know, I, I think take it with a grain of salt for those of you listening, because every freelancer's life and, and juggle and balance looks a bit different. Um, but it, it has actually become a norm. Like I have spent on and off up to three years reporting a story. Um, and, and so, you know, I think investing in that first piece can be really important and can open a lot of doors. Um, setting expectations with yourself that when you sort of become passionate about an idea and you know there's something more there and you want to um, investigate it further, look for sources, and you become passionate about a potential story, just know that if it takes you a very long time, upwards of a year or more, that is okay. That is like, you are not slow. You are not, you know, incompetent or lesser. Um, because our new cycle moves so quickly, I think, you know, I often have had like anxiety induced weeks where I'm like, I haven't published anything in a really long time. And it's taken me years to kind of start to accept that as just my pace and that that is okay. Um, logistically, because a long form project can take so long for myself, I now sort of, I, I have always been a big spreadsheets person. Um, and so I use spreadsheets and to-do lists to track everything. Now, when I start a new project, I start um, a, a spreadsheet for keeping track of sources I start developing, a list of names, contact information, when I last reached out to them, who to reach out to next. Um, I have a spreadsheet uh, for just for fellowships and deadlines and how much money it provides, um, what like types of stories they're generally looking for. Uh, editor contacts, just to keep track of everyone I've been in touch with. Um, and I also have, start, have started keeping more recently um, like a diary of my reporting, just so that I can do a little mental dump after each day of research. Um, and then I will also say like pitching, especially in the beginning, and even now I will say like, I'm on contract this year for the first time with the Times Magazine. I've still, I've gotten rejections this year. Um, it, it's gotten a little bit easier, but I will, I would not go as far as saying it's a walk in the park now. It's not. Pitching is just so hard. This field is just really, really difficult. Um, and so that just no rejections, things taking a very long time, like that is normal. Um, I have actually, I try, it's still a struggle, but I, I try to look at the pitching process. Um, 
more as practice than anything else and a way to remind editors that I'm still here and that I'm interested in a particular idea. That tends to soften the blow a bit when the answer is no or the answer is this is interesting, but we just did something somewhat similar that you know is not that similar. Um, but there's so much in our industry that like one individual freelance writer cannot control. Um, and so a lot of a lot of the battle, I think, are, is like, you know, overcoming your own expectations and fears and anxieties and insecurities. It's it's a work in progress. Oh my gosh, so much of that resonates with me since I'm right now trying to pitch a long form story and it has been three years since, you know, I, or two years, two years since I started reporting it. Um, and I had one editor tell me, well, uh, I was pitching a story about airway health and they said, well, we've written a story about teeth this year. I'm like, it's okay. <laughs> I guess you can't do two stories that involve teeth or faces or airways. Valeria, what would you add to that? <laughs> no, I am also thinking um, about the side that I've seen as an editor now. And uh, people come to me sometimes. They've been pitching to a lot of places and they discover Palabra and they've already like incurred into, I could see lots of expenses and they've traveled internationally and frankly I don't know how I did it I don't know how they do it so one of the things that I try to encourage them is to seek fellowships to recover some of the expenses for that travel uh you know like the Pulitzer Center is a good place the International Women's Media Foundation is very supportive uh the Fund for Investigative Journalism is an, another great place I am a member of the board there and we really want to see more diversity in the applications so I think that those are some of the things that I've learned that really helped me. Um, frankly, it is hard. And I think what we're most of us are saying is uh, because of the time involvement, because of all the resources it requires, you know, you're kind of like a business. Uh, even when you want to pitch, you do have to make this initial investment of hours and hours of reporting. Maybe you even pay a researcher, which is something that uh, Jaya recommended to me. And so all of those things, you need to have a pot of funds to be able to sustain yourself. So uh, someone was asking about the balance. Uh, I think, yeah, one thing for me was like, okay, no more than one st <laughs> non form story per year. And also choosing carefully how much energy I was going to put into each project because those of us who love long form as we were discussing earlier, we want to turn everything into long form and not everything has to be. And so sometimes we are our worst enemies because of how dedicated we are. So you have to say, no, this is this is what I'm being paid for. This is as far as I will go. And this is where the story is at. And that, that's, you have to kind of come to compromises with yourself. Uh, I love really like when I hear you, Jaya, the fact that you carve time to write a diary at the end of the day, like that is like a huge success in time management. Like you are making that space. I I was working for a while, so crammed, so crammed, like that, like being able to like, you know, get things off my chest. Sometimes the way I did that is like, I wrote to a friendly editor. Hey, you know, I know you're not necessarily taking my pitch, but let me tell you about all the reporting I did on this trip, like, you know, so I could just like get it out somehow. So anyways, lessons learned, fellowships, uh, help. And then also ask, ask the publications, hey, you know, I invested a lot. Like how much can you put here to reimburse me for, for these uh, trips, for the transcripts, for gas? Don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to ask. Uh, I am a friendly editor. So for the most part, I often tend to say yes or try to help you uh, find the resources. But yeah, do not be afraid. Oh, Valeria, I love it. Um, I and it resonates also. My first long form piece was in 2010, and I was like, "Oh, I've done it! Now I'm going to have so many assignments." And then it took me till 2015 to have my second piece, and I was so excited when I got that pitch accepted that I forgot to ask for reimbursement for expenses. But I just emailed the editor at Mother Jones. I said, I forgot to ask. I know I signed the contract, but I spent $900. Can you reimburse me? And she said, yes. So 
it really doesn't hurt to ask. And I think the editors understand. I had one editor tell me when I cold pitched him and he accepted it and I was happy. He said, there's only a couple dozen people in this country who can even do long form journalism, who can mm -hmm. see a project through to completion. So you're more valuable than you know. And um, that was also very validating. Um, so we earlier we talked uh, the, the issue of contracts came up. I would love to hear from folks about, in particular for a long form project, is there anything you should look for um, or ask to have included in the contract for a long form project? Any red flags? Don't let them take your movie rights and book rights and all that. And I learned that um, <clears throat> even when I was uh, freelance editing for a place that I didn't know their contract situation. I just knew the writers. And um, I know that I had, there was one writer who had been working, I think it was a memoir piece and had went to get an MFA and didn't know when she signed the contract that she signed away the rights for like a book and all these things. Um, and it wasn't for a lot of money, you know? And so um, every place now, it seems, will work to get those rights. Uh, from you and um you know that's something that you don't always win that fight unfortunately but um but be very aware of like you know the fact that i mean i've, I've certainly screwed myself in that area several times too <laughs> actually um and you just, you just have to be very careful about the language because a lot of places now see that as um they try to do a rights scrap and i have an agent that helps negotiate with the with for that other people have lawyers other people can do that themselves and have done that successfully maybe Jaya I don't know if you want to talk about that too a little bit but um but it is something to really pay attention to yeah for sure I think I think the rights battle is the kind of like you know uh the battle of today the contract battle for freelancers of today um I I I yeah, it's so funny because, you know, we all only work with a certain number of publications, so it's hard to know, like, exactly where things are shifting. I would like to think that um, there, you know, I, well, I still see this clause, but um, the one that, like, is always to watch out for is the indemnification clause, um, which sort of Kaki or anyone else on this panel who any other panelists who want to correct me, but basically it it sort of depending on how it's written, it can give you more or less legal protection in in the instance that in the off chance that there's a lawsuit um, that arises from the story. That's a big one I look for. Definitely the rights. Um, usually you'll see the phrase. Uh, if you see the phrase work for hire, or if you see the phrase um, derivative derivatives, and if it seems the publication is trying to own those rights, that's a red flag. Um, I have had many, and I'm, and I'm still in the middle of contract negotiations that have been going on for months, mostly just waiting to hear back um, and continuing to report the story in the meantime, not knowing if this is all going to work out or not. Um, uh, this is this story is not currently with the Times, uh, which has a fairly decent contract. Uh, two things that helped me a lot with contracts, um, just because you know we're not lawyers, and I think that's where publications tend to get away with grabbing rights or not paying enough or having terms that favor them more. That is just you know it's not necessarily a malicious thing. Um, but it's it's part of of the business side of things. And so have if you are able to outsource that, if you have a friend who's a lawyer, if you have freelancer friends who can look help you look over those contracts, um, I have from time to time, not for every contract, but I've paid a lawyer who I was introduced to through another freelancer friend here in the Bay. Um, is pretty badass and just having the confidence and the security of knowing someone is here yes you're paying them but someone is here to back you up um and helping you navigate some complicated legal language that's just a huge mental load and you can that way you can focus on the reporting um 
So I, that's definitely one benefit. Um, also the, uh, I'm sure I know Kaki is all over this with, with the IAJ, um, also the freelance investigative reporters and editors, you can email them and they'll send you, if you join their email list, they'll send you a template um, for uh, like what a, what a, a good um, contract looks like for a freelance reporter. Um, so that's another good resource that I'd recommend. I just want to say very quickly that a lot of publications get away with the things in their contract because people are eager to publish, right? They want to be in a certain publication or they want, and so sometimes they overlook these really important things in the contract because they're just so excited that this publication accepted my pitch, accepted my idea. I am going to be able to write this, you know, very important, impactful piece without, you know, and so they sign on the dotted line without actually uh, realizing what, what it says. But I, I really think, uh, I don't want to say people, uh, publications prey on people's desire to be, to be published, but people do want to be published. And uh, some people just, they don't read the whole the whole contract because it's the excitement of actually, you know, ha, I finally did it. I finally was able to, to get this publication to notice me and they accepted my pitch and I'm writing for them, unfortunately. <laughs> yes, I have had the experience of um, pushing back on a contract and being told, oh, we'll give you the other contract. I'm like, oh, the writer friendly one. Okay, thanks. Next time, can you just give it to me first, the first time? instead of me having to ask for it. So, yeah. Um, so we have so many questions. We have good questions coming in um, in the chat. I think I'm gonna take some from the Q&A because there are so many. And I wonder if we could do a, spe a sort of visual answer here because there are couples like quantitative uh, questions. So if everyone could hold up a finger, how many long form stories can you work on at a time? One, two, three, Four, three, Jaya. Oh my gosh, Jaya and Erica. I my brain only has room for one. Mine too. <laughs> and then, um, in a year, how many could you do? So my answer will be the same. One. In a year. Interesting. Okay, very cool. Um, and then we had some questions about where do you get your ideas? Um, how do you decide which one to prioritize? And then how much pre-reporting do you do before you know it's ready to pitch? I already told you guys how I got my, my project idea for, <laughs> for my, my recidivism project. It started off with just in my everyday reporting on the criminal justice system, how one statistic stood out for me. And that's how I got the idea to do uh, a long form project around recidivism. Uh, and uh, Jaya and I both were uh, Fund for Investigative Journalism Diversity Fellows. And I see one of our other fellow mates, <laughs> Sonia Paul is, is, in our, is, is on the line. Uh, and so, just pitching that piece, I just, that that statistic was disturbing to me and that's how I got that idea. Just ask why. <laughs> I was like, why is this the way it is? <laughs> um, I would say when it's something that I can't stop thinking about that tells me that it's really um, something that you can dive into. I went to a really wonderful panel at ASJA that was titled something like dreamers, fools and weirdos and like saying basically those are really good central characters. So I do think when I find a Don Quixote type, you know, who's just like ha on a mission, like I, I tend to write a lot of solutions journalism. So that can often be a really good central character. But I'd be curious the other three you do. Do you start with the character, the idea, the topic? I could just say quickly, I think about it in a couple different ways. Like I'm often shifting like the way my life goes to like, what, what are my interests? I think that's a great part of being an independent journalist. You can just write about what your 
super curious and fascinated about in that period of your life. Um, but I often think of like finding it on the macro level first, like here's the big idea. How do I tell this as a narrative though? And then that requires finding the people, finding the people who tell that story, right? Um, but sometimes you just encounter people who are larger than life. And then you're trying to figure out how do I pitch this to a place that understands that there's a macro um, kind of big picture story here too that's magazine worthy because you're all, you often have to prove what is the newsworthy uh, you know, part of this story. Why, why do we need this right now? Um, and also, just looking into your into your own life sometimes, and thinking about what are the what are the issues that I feel personally affected by, or you know, that I'm just really working out myself. <laughs> and then, who are the people that maybe I could continue these conversations with and have, um, you know, learn from that as well. Uh, and, and so, I'm always kind of shifting my focus around, but it's always there's common themes that often run through my work, but that's sort of how I, I think about finding story ideas. I wanted to share that uh, great frustration of mine is that there are periods in my life I had all these ideas, right? Just way too many. The problem is I couldn't like really like land them because I just had. So finally, I, I attended a workshop on immigration at Berkeley ages ago. I came back and I said, this is shit. I'm not letting go any single one of this. So I grabbed like, printer papers and I wrote all okay this is the story put it on the wall and so I filled my my wall in my house with all these different story ideas that I wanted to do and then I went like okay it was maybe just a word right like children in detention or or you know asylum seeking children after what happens to them once they arrive and 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 then I I went for them there was something about putting them in the world that made them tangible um, and I think, you know, maybe keeping it in a Google Doc or something, uh, because in my field, like the, the, the fountain drains that you have no ideas, but you actually do, it's just that you don't pin them and you have to, uh, to see them so that you can come back to them when you're like, I have no idea. Oh, here it is. You have plenty of ideas. I usually like, and I find them usually through people, um, being out there reporting, leads me to find ideas so uh, currently i'm not doing a whole lot of reporting so the ideas that i have are inspired by the work other people are doing pretty much um valeria also you put some great uh inf information into the chat but it was only to the panelists if you could copy and send it to everyone that would be great um, I'm, I'm guessing, Erica, when you met, when you learned of twins who were separated through adoption, and then one of the twins who was adopted in America had another sister who was adopted, that you were like, must write. Yeah, I mean, that was that was also obviously born out of like, where was I at in my life at that point? I had I have a mother of twins, so I was, you know, researching twin science and led me to different um, twin pairs and then this one in particular I became especially um, drawn to. I will say just you mentioned earlier um, tacky about like getting pitched or you pitch stories and sometimes they say well I already did that story and in the book world I will say that also occurs and it's, it's really frustrating and hard. I remember when we were pitching this book idea uh, there were many rejections and one of the rejections was what well, we just did uh, the twins were born in Vietnam and separated at birth and one of the rejections was well we already just bought a book about a Hmong rice farmer and the two ideas just couldn't be you know more similar <laughs> they're not that similar but they seem too similar and uh, you know those are the kind of rejections that <laughs> that you receive in the book world. And so it's even more blatant um, sometimes and ridiculous. Um, you know, I, I can't say that the book world was changing. I know that there's a lot of, there's a lot of people pushing and trying to change and you know that and inclusion for more diverse books. But certainly when I tried to um, pitch this book, I was running into that. Yeah, the, we've already had an Asian book this year. So no room for any more. Just another reminder, Somewhere Sisters, available everywhere books are sold. Um, there's so many good questions. I'm going to ask a sort of a combination. 
given that long form journalism as a freelancer doesn't guarantee financial security, how do each of you balance the other work that you do alongside this? Particularly, how do you avoid being brain fried and overworked? And is there anything you'd add about how this whole process and this field is inherently exploitative of us? So the beauty of long form journalists is they think about their answer before they jump in. So I'll just give mine, which is that it's changed over the 14 years that I've been a freelancer. I used to do a fair amount of editing um, for nonprofits and um, and that gave me sort of a different thing to use my brain for that didn't tax the same skills as working on long form work. Now I do a fair amount of speed uh, speaking paid, not speed. <laughs> I do a fair amount of paid speaking, and that subsidizes the long form journalism. And I really do think that I prioritize sleep. I prioritize downtime because it's so it hurts my brain to do long form journalism. And so my brain has to be at its best. So I just don't know how to do it being brain fried. And so I just make sure that I am not. Yeah, I've had to do therapy. <laughs> so, and that's not just because of the, you know, how you do feel exploited a lot of times that it is so incredibly hard, but then you're often working on these stories that are traumatic. I know I have, and I know everybody here has. Um, and so these stories, you live with them for years, like Valeria was saying earlier, and it just, it becomes, it's, you know, it's part of you. And you're trying to hold them with such care. So um, I think uh, the other thing that I try to do is just, I've just really had to remind myself when I was a reporter at the LA Times, I, I thought that that was my identity a lot. Of, I mean, I was in my twenties and I thought this, I've made it and this is who I am. And everywhere I'd go, I'm a reporter, I'm a reporter. And then you leave and you realize, um, you know, that life is sort of behind you and now you're separated. And um, I've just had to learn, you know, that that's one part. I know that we've heard this before, but what you're doing is one part of your identity. Even writing a book, it's like one part of this whole, you know, career path that you're on, that this whole many bodies, this, the many things that you're going to produce, your body of work, plus your life, your mother, being a mother, all the friends you have. Hopefully you have friends and family who, you know, maybe they're proud of you that you do these things, but they don't always know exactly what you do. That's kind of how my... <laughs> family is sometimes and um but they love you no matter what and that's what's important you like it just grounds you um and I think that's really important to just have you know realize that your identity is many things and it's not just this work even though this work is so important to us I, I can add a bit just I'm constantly thinking about priorities um in both my personal life and work life and I think it's a habit that's like blood over from just be, like being a freelancer I'll do another plug for like the accountability having an accountability buddy um Kati and I loosely follow a philosophy called the one thing where um the one thing is usually the long form story for both of us and we are just every year, month and week, we are looking at um, what's like, what is the kind of small step you're going to take today or this week to inch toward publishing your, your long form idea. And then everything else, the making the money, the taking care of your kid, my um, husband and I take care of um, his elder and, and also my parents, and we have a whole ecosystem going. Like, you know, as Eric is saying, we are more than just like people churning out stories. And I think recognizing that about yourself um, and then kind of knowing that there is this goal you're trying to meet um, and that you will eventually get there. I think part part of the reality of why these stories take so long um, is because you have to do that juggle in between. That's why like most many of us are saying one story maybe per year. I think if you're publishing one per year, that's actually pretty damn good, um, pretty good fast, actually. Um, but just kind of like keeping in mind and and building your schedule out around this priority, whether it's you're spending 10 minutes a day thinking about ideas, um, 10 minutes just writing a few emails, 
um, if that's all you can afford. But just having that kind of structure has been like really important and instrumental for, for my own work and process. Thank you, Jaya. Lottie or Valeria, did you want to add to that? Oops, I think you're muted, Lottie, sorry. Okay, can you hear me now? There you go. Okay, I just want to say for many years, I worked for a quarterly, right, which only publishes four times a year, which, which gave me the space and time to work on long freelance long form. So I had that advantage of uh, having an income coming in in that the publication I worked for was a quarterly. So that was a really big thing. Number two, I really do believe that at times you mentioned in a question about being exploitative, right? Uh, I just remember doing a big piece for a, a major mainstream publication. I was so excited because I was like, oh, I'm going to be in this publication. And I got so paid so little. <laughs> I'm like, I did so much work. And I tried to negotiate with the editors like, hey, I talked to the Department of Justice and I did this and I had to download this. And, and I think I got maybe $100 more. <laughs> And I was just like, oh my God, but I think it's, you know, they know people want to be in those big name mainstream publications. And I feel like it's ex in some cases it could be exploitative in that uh in terms of the in terms of the rates. Uh yeah. But I use it in 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 my clips now. <laughs> it's one of my calling cards. So <laughs> And they bet on that. They're like, hey, you're going to have the opportunity to put us on your resume, right? And show other publications this clip, this big story that you did, right? And so they're like, hey, so, you know, what are you complaining about? You get to put us on, on your resume in, in your clips. That's happening to me right now. That's a conversation <laughs> I'm having with the client right now. Um, and, and, I, and I do think it's helpful to raise, we talked about this in our pre-planning call, my three P's model that any assignment should pay well, be for your passion or something that you really are excited about, or be for your portfolio. And ideally more than one, you know, but, but you need to know what's the reason and then, you know, stay accountable to that. So, um, Quick question, uh, if anyone has a suggestion of publications that are better for less well known writers to get interested or get engaged with long form or other publications. I know we've talked about Cal Sunday and Pacific Standard and some of the ones that are gone, but anything new in long form that excites you guys or that you'd recommend people look at um, as a possible outlet. What about places like net narratively or places like long reads. Um, I'm not quite sure of their rates because I haven't written for them before, but I do know that they they are long form pieces and they accept a lot of freelance, a lot of freelance pieces. I did just hear from an editor at Narratively that they're looking for cinematic ideas. They're looking for anything that can be a podcast, movie, or Netflix spinoff. So, and they pay a dollar a word, I believe. Um, I'm a big fan of the Atavis. I don't know if that's, I think you probably, I think they just want great ideas too. Um, and they have, have a great editor, Katya, who's on the chat, has done an incredible piece for, for them. And so, and they pay well, I think and it helps cover expenses and everything. Um, I don't think that's necessarily, I don't know how, I mean, if they go by credentials or just how great your pitch is, um, but that's the one that I really love. And I think Catapult may accept long form stories uh, as well. Are you guys familiar with Catapult? They have really good pieces. Yeah, I think of them as more essays than okay. journalism, but I think there's a lot of crossover. Um, so a couple of questions coming in about pitching. Can each of you address how, do you, how much pre-reporting you do, right? And sort of maybe when you know it's ready to pitch. And then anything about like how long that pitch is, how much you've put into it, and you know how do you find the right match for where to pitch it? Generally, for a long form pitch, um, I usually I used to do a lot of reporting, and um, that's when I was trying to break in. I I really would have kind of done. Uh, 
um, extensive reporting to get a pitch in. Um, I realize now that's not really the best way to do it because you don't always know if you're going to get the story sold and um, uh, it's, you know, hard on time. But um, now, but I think for a long form pitch, always I do have like sort of a central person at least um, identified that I've gained access to um, and the idea of how the story will be a narrative. And so my pitches tend to run long and um, uh, longer than maybe, um, you know, some pitches I can even share. I'll share a pitch dissection that Katya did once for Neiman. Um, but, and I also think uh, if you haven't yet connected to the open notebook, the pitch database, that's incredibly helpful. Um, they have a whole pitch database with different pitches for different publications and magazines and what actually became um, magazine pieces. And I often use that when I'm teaching and having students try to practice pitching too. But I do think it's helpful to have reporting to make sure that you have access so that you don't look like a fool if you get the assignment and then you don't have the access. <laughs> I want to say this about pitching. When I was the editor of the Crisis Magazine, I received so many pitches that did not fit my publication. It's like people had not read the publication and they did not know what we were about. They just knew we were a historical publication and but they they pitched something that uh, was not good for the publication. And so be very, 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 very familiar with this publication before pitching them. You know the angle and perspective that they are interested in, uh, what, kind of, what kind of publication it is, who to pitch. Uh, you know, I, I, someone said, oh, I wrote this long pitch and I was rejected. Uh, I, I, I will reject. I will reject pitches because they had my name wrong. Like they will put Jet Magazine's editor <laughs> pitch it to me, <laughs> right? So make sure you get that. I'm, I'm saying things everyone already knows, but I'm just going to review. Make sure you have the editor's name correct. Make sure that you are familiar with the publication uh, and that what you want to pitch fits that publication. Uh, we were not business, we were not lifestyle, we were social issues, political issues, Black history, you know, uh, art, uh, culture, some, some culture, not a lot of culture. We did very little entertainment until there was the uh, NAACP Image Awards, right? But, you know, I just, I really encourage people to become extremely familiar with the the platform you want to pitch. And, you know, people want to know why are you the best person to do this story? Have you done anything, you know, in terms of pre-reporting, what else have you done on this issue? As I said earlier, my wheelhouse is the civil rights movement. I've been writing about that for 20 plus years. So when I write a pitch, I include all of the links not all of them, but so at least five links to my previous to other stories that I've done for other publications around civil rights, just so they they could number one see my writing style, number two to show them that I have been published in major mainstream publications, and that I have the capacity and experience to do this work. That's another thing when you pitch; they want to know that you can do it. You know, they want to know that you can do the story that you are pitching. So I showed them, these are the other stories that I've done. And these, you know, and these are the places where they were published. Uh, and so pe people want to know that editors want, being an editor, I want to know where else have you been published? What else have you done? What else have you written about this subject? You know, and, and why are you the person to do this? We have really great, I have great ideas. I'm like, hmm, I'm not sure I'm the, correct, the right person to do this story, right? Uh, but I, I think we should look at that when pitching. Don't pitch it because you want to be published in a certain magazine. Pitch because you believe you can do the story. It's an important story. You feel that it has a, a, a big impact and that uh, 
you you have the resources to like sometimes I say I will interview this person, this person, this person, right? Or I will interview this. Sometimes I, I throw that in, sometimes not. But sometimes, sometimes some editors want to know, well, who do you have access to that you can pull this off? What resources are you going to use? Uh, and I think that's very important um, when, when pitching. Yes, Lottie, so much of that resonates. We only have six minutes left. I'm going to ask each person to just share one final thought. And in the meantime, there's so much good stuff in the chat. I really recommend everyone look at that. I'll try to save it and send it out in next week's newsletter. Um, if those of you who are here, I feel like the audience has had as, so much to contribute as well. If you could each share one thing you heard today that encouraged you or that was new or that you're going to take away that was helpful, I'd love to see people put in the chat something that one of our panelists said that was uh, useful or that you'll you'll learn you'll learn from today. Um, and then I would just echo what um, Lottie said that when you pitch and also what Erica said, I think when I pitch a long form story, it's usually 800, 900 words and you sort of write it like you'd write the article. I usually read two or three issues of the magazine to sort of get the voice and the pace and the style in my head before I sit down to write and then explain the answers to three questions that every editor needs to know. Why this story for my audience? So you need to show you know the audience and that this is relevant and they haven't already covered it. Two, why now? So why is this urgent or is there a news peg or some reason they should yet say yes today? And why me? You know, do what access do I have? Um, what background in reporting I have? Why am I the person, the only person who could possibly pull off this story? And as Erica said, I do outline, you know, I see this as like, these are the central characters. These are the kind of scenes I would include just so that they have a sense that I have a narrative arc, that it's not just gonna be a mess <laughs> when I turn it in. Um, and then I will uh, just ask a, as a final question, I see Valeria had, had something to add. So I'll go first to Valeria and would like to hear from each of you. What do you love about long form? So why do you put yourself through this and want to live in this world? Or, you know, is there anything that really makes you feel like this is a, a form of journalism really worth doing? Valeria? Oh, why I love it is because of the, um, of how it transforms me as a human to spend time and learn and bear witness to other people's experiences. And that's like why I love journalism because I want to be exposed to what it does to me as a human. Um, and then I just wanted to say, trust your gut. All of you here who are in long form, who are like putting your money up front to do things you really have a passion and you really have a commitment and I'm sure you're doing it for the right reasons. Trust your gut because if that publication that you're hoping for doesn't work, there will be another one that's going to want it. Just trust your gut and also be willing to just don't be hard-headed about it. Sometimes you have to pivot. Sometimes the story is not what you thought it had to be. And if you are too hard-headed, you're going to be stuck. So I just wanted to say that and uh, keep up your good work. Um, I I would say um, I think that uh, I think that I love long form because I'm, you know, it helps me answer the question or try seek to answer um, questions about what it means to just be a human, <laughs> to be honest, and and and. I think that a lot of us put a lot of pressure on ourselves to do stories that maybe might change society or change policy in some way. Um, and sometimes, you know, we're 10 years later and things are still happening and that can feel very frustrating. And so one piece of advice that I have always taken with me is that we are trying to, you know, part the curtain on humanity. We're trying to, you know, give these human experiences and make people feel something in our writing. And so, whether I'm reading the long form work of everybody on this panel and the audience, uh, the people that I admire, I keep, you know, when I was a really young reporter, I would keep like file fol folders of different writers that I just loved, different journalists to keep just as inspiration. And um, I think that's, that's what kind of just keeps me going through all of the ups and downs. Um, and, and yeah, so that's all. 
Erica, can you also share just briefly your first long form, this being on the bus with the girl? My first long form piece ever? The one Wait. where you were at the LA Times and you were on the bus with a girl going to visit. Oh, her oh, yeah. So that was just, so that's the other thing I want to say, I guess is a good point. You don't have to think of long form as 10,000 words. And when I was on staff at the LA Times, I was learning how to just do narrative sometimes. And I had a weekend assignment and um, the assignment was to cover a Mother's Day story. And it was, so I, you know, there were kids going to visit their mothers in prison and to turn that into a narrative um i decided to spend the evening before with this teenager she was going to the prison um before the day before she was going to go on the bus for six hours to meet her mother so she'd done this many times she puts on these like fabulous gold earrings she picks them out bamboo earrings she's gonna you know she has her whole outfit flatted out i ride the bus with her at six in the morning the next day she's like writing rap lyrics and i'm just like witnessing this she gets to the prison they say you can't wear those earrings in her grandma had told her you're not going to get those earrings past security she gets them in anyway <laughs> um as everybody's saying goodbye to her or to their parents at the end of the visit all the children are crying and she's 16 and she's like you know not crying at all and looking around and um and she just sort of leaves the prison she's done this before she has her earrings intact but the whole thing was really to me, a coming of age story. And that was something, you know, it's a small story, but it's a way to turn a weekend assignment, something that maybe is like feeling like a daily into something with these emotions, these details that you report. It's a, um, it's a, it's a human story. And so I, I live for those. I love those. And it's such a privilege to be able to tell those, whether it's in that form or in the book form too. So. Thank you. Lottie, Jaya, what do you love about this format? Well, first I want to uh, mention something that I didn't mention earlier. And I would like, you know, all of our, uh, all of those who are joining us on this Zoom to research fellowships because uh, journalismjobs.com has a list of journalism fellowships. I want to mention that one, someone who wrote a story for me about uh, how Medicaid, uh, contributed to the bankruptcy of nursing homes in black neighborhoods in Pittsburgh. And he had five different fellowships <laughs> to write this story, including the Fund for Investigative Journalism Fellowship and including the Alicia Patterson Fellowship, which I think pays upward of maybe $40,000. That's like a big fellowship. So he had five fellowships to write this piece. Um, but, in, but in terms of what I love most uh, about this form is just being able to go deep and being able to connect uh, with someone that you're not able to connect with, just doing like a quick hit. Um, I remember two pieces, I'm gonna say them very briefly. I wrote a piece called Wednesdays in Mississippi that, that actually received a award from the National Association of Black Journalists. It was a little known fact of the civil rights movement that black and white women joined together and rode buses to the South uh, to help distribute uh, supplies to freedom summer schools in the deep South. And I had never heard about this program. I'm from Mississippi, I'm from the deep South. So it's an opportunity to learn uh, about little known facts that you've never uh, knew before, but also to connect with people. I can recall earlier this year, someone who was featured in my recidivism story sent me an email and she was one who had been in and out of jail over the past five, 10 years. And she said, Lottie, I have not returned to prison. I have a job and I have an apartment. I was like, wow. And she said, I'm off drugs. I'm on the right path. I get to see my children. And I'm like, that's the type of impact that we want to make, right? Uh, she, we did her story and she got her, she said, I want to get my life together. She had, as I said, had been in and out of jail for more than a decade. She had lost custody of her children. She was on drugs, but for her to send me that email, I have a job. I have an apartment. I can see my kids. I'm off drugs. That made me smile. And that's one of the reasons why, why I do this, uh, do this work. Love it, Lottie. Jaya? Ooh, so much um, left to say. Um, and yeah, that's, that's all very powerful words, everyone. Um, one thing I've been trying to 
tell myself these days a lot is is to shift my thinking um from you're only valuable you know the whole the whole um saying in our field um of like you're only as good as your last byline like I think there's a lot of unlearning we have to do oftentimes um you know especially if you're coming up and um toxic or semi-toxic or accidental unintentionally toxic work cultures um and something I'm trying to tell myself these days is that you know like if you get to practice long form, you know, if you're making time for it and you're going at it and showing up for the work every day, that is living the dream. Um, doesn't matter if you're like, you know, the last six months have only been rejections. The fact that um, I, I feel like six years in, which is not that long, especially compared to some of us on the call. Um, but I think it's been enough time for me to see enough cycles of long form projects of my own to realize that if I keep at it, eventually I will get to the point where I'm like out there reporting the story. Um, eventually there will be a publication and editor I want to work with. I There have been projects that I've had to give up on. And I think Valeria's point earlier about like knowing when to pivot, that could be a whole other panel probably. Um, but just kind of for me, the, the mental shift from like, it is a privilege for me to get to do this work rather than like, why is this so hard? Because I, I've been on both sides. And again, it's a battle almost daily, um, but it is true, you know, and I, I just got back from Cleveland recently to report on a story about um, family caregivers. And I myself am one and sitting there spending a week with this um, daughter and mom uh, and to be able to connect with her and relate to each other and to feel like, you know, not only do you have this opportunity to restore some dignity in this ordinary person's life who's doing extraordinary things, um, that, I mean, it's, that feeling is indescribable, I think. Um, and so, you know, that the times or the number of days in my year where I get to <laughs> experience that feeling are so few and far between, but it does when I'm in it. Um, and right now I'm in sort of my other favorite part of the process, which is just like actually sitting down and writing and getting to be creative. Um, but I think the nature of any creative work is, is, is quite hard. And in journalism, it's especially hard. Um, so you know, it is, it is worth it. And I think the way we kind of define our value is, is really important. Thank you so much, Jaya. Yeah, I, I hope we can do some unlearning here at the Institute for Independent Journalists, because that's certainly how I came up literally in the newsroom, they would say, you're only as good as your last byline. So um, there's so much in the chat about people wanting to stay connected. Um, I will try to, let's see, Erica, would you be willing to maybe create a Google Doc and put it in the chat and then people can fill in email addresses and, um, and I meant Erica Mailman, <laughs> not Erica Ayazaki. Um, <clears throat> um, people can fill in their email addresses and, um, and names so that we can stay in touch because I do think connecting with each other is one way to sustain energy for the work. Uh, I certainly feel so inspired after this conversation. So thank you so much, Erica Hayasaki, Valeria Fernandez, Jaya Lee, Lydie Joyner. I also want to call out Sarah Bell, Bell Lynn and Iona Brannon behind the scenes helping us um, with production and recaps and Mia Alexander and um, also, um, Arothi, um, who is our newsletter um, writer, thank you so much to all the volunteers who are making this possible. And the plug, remember, uh, fellowships webinar is next month. So um, for those of you who are intrigued about finding funding for those long form stories, on December 9th at 12 p.m., we will um, be presenting how to win money for your work with fellowships with four amazing fellowship directors. We have Ashley Sharp from MIT's Night Science Journalism Fellowship, Dean Beckay, you may have heard of, executive editor for the New York Times Local Investigations Fellowship, Lynette Clementson 
for the Knight Wallace Fellowship and Noi Thrupkeo of the Ida B. Wells Fellowship at Type Investigations. And moderator Alyssa Figuera has had a lot of fellowships herself and will be um, also uh, steering the conversation. So please register for that if you haven't already. In January, we'll be talking book publishing. And most important, on March 9th and 10th, we will be having a conference where we will finally get to dive into the depths of all the things we touch on in these webinars, but don't have the time and space to really explore. So please save the date and um, look for the call for proposals in our um, newsletter. And I see people chatting on the chat. I'm sorry, we're gonna have to close the webinar soon, but uh, please do um, stay in touch and we will look for the, the newsletter because we'll put a way to stay in touch, whether it's Slack or Discord or whatever um, in that newsletter. So thank you again, everyone, for being here, for taking extra time out of your day with us, and we'll see you in December.